want to show you something, and I want you to catch this in your thinking. Most of the world has no idea what time we've arrived in because they woke up in the time. I'm not sure this generation knows what time we've arrived in, but they've arrived in this time willing. Willing and with a fire inside their spirit that's ready to possess the land. The land that most before them stayed on the other side. And we've come to this time for the second time. When Joshua approached the Jordan, he said, more or less, this is the second time, this is the last time. God has offered the others to cross, they would not. They spent 40 years in a wilderness of legalistic mindsets that made them wander in a circle like this for 40 years until a generation died. That's all religion is good for is to kill a generation of people. It locks them in to we only eat this kind of coconut off of this palm tree and we never do ever go see another palm tree. told Adam he said you see all these trees I gave you all of them the only one you can't eat of is the tree of that knowledge of good and evil where you're going to start judging everybody else he said leave that to me I, I, nobody heard that but me and a couple people he said you see that tree give that one to me you can have all of these to eat free, but give that one to me. You're not qualified to judge between that. He said, I'll do that. The day Adam decided to be judge was the day legalism was born. And he totally ignored the supernatural event because all Adam had to do was raise up his shirt and he had no navel. Everyone else had one of those, but him and his wife. Because they wasn't born, they were created. So he ignored the supernatural origin of where he came from and decided to go another way. Religion kills a generation. The only true religion is to take care of the orphan and the widow. Everything else is just legalism in that point. Now sin is sin and right is right and wrong is wrong. Make no mistake about that. But when you start eating of that tree and saying, it's wrong because I say it's wrong. You can't wear your hair a certain way because I say it's wrong. You can't wear makeup because I say it's wrong. You can't wear bell bottoms, we used to call them, because I say it's wrong. And you can't worship like this because I say it's wrong. You have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Bible said you became half dead. And you're living out of either the dead side of your thinking or the live side of your thinking. Even if you don't want to cross, help them cross. And then you go back and live on your side if that's what you want to do. But help them cross they have no problem with crossing all they want to know is is there one person left that God they looked at Joshua and said is God with you if he is with you the way we heard he was with Moses the way he was with Moses will follow you anywhere Joshua didn't make excuse he didn't say that power passed away with Moses he didn't say anything like that 
He said, bring the Ark of the Covenant out here. I want to show you what your covenant will really do. I want to show you the power of Moses, and I want to show you where he got it from. He brought that covenant out, and the priest, the priest, I said, the priest, the priest, say the priest, come on, the priest, look at your neighbor, the priest, it was the priest that bore the Ark upon their shoulders. The Levites. The Levitical law placed the covenant above them. They put the covenant above them. But when Uzzah and the children of Israel took the ark back from the Philistines, they placed it in a new cart. A cart is made out of boards and wheels. So they put the covenant under the control of big boards and big wheels. And they let their animal appetites pull it. And the man sat above it in the driver's seat. And the animal appetite stumbled. When you see all these animal appetites being ordained in the pulpit, it gets quiet in here, doesn't it? They're going to stumble at some point. You can't let homosexuality be ordained in a pulpit. It will stumble at some point because it's an animal urge. Religion is just about the same way. It just pulls everything by its own dictates. I remember when everybody said, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong because I don't buy Starbucks coffee. Because I don't like Dagon that's on the cup. And when they matched all their funds to the LGBT, no, to Planned Parenthood to commit abortion, I was done. I was out. I remember Mark looked at me one day and said, I'm out. I'm out. I said, me too. I'm out. But let me show you where religion was. It was a big deal across the internet. Religion got all in the line buying their Dagon cups who refused to support Israel in the war. That ought to be enough right there. And they're, they're all in line. Now this is, this is Christian people all in line. Now let me show you something. I'm, I'm talking about good people. They're all in line. At Christmas, they gave them a coffee. It didn't have Dagon on the cup. It was just a red cup. And they said, oh. they refused to put Merry Christmas. Oh, those devils. They refused to put Merry Christmas on it, but still they got their pumpkin lattes. They got mad at the red cup, totally ignoring the pagan god hanging over the building on a sign that was supporting abortion and, and not supporting Israel and standing for everything that was wrong. But religion was mad over the red cup. That's a little bit stupid, don't you think? What is that? That's eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's placing yourself above the ark. Instead, the Lord always intended. He said it has to be carried on the shoulders of the Levites. The Levitical law. You have to put the covenant above the law and only judge it by that. When they were told, 
when people decided and they said we're going to be the high priest instead of Aaron Moses said all right let's see what the Lord says the Lord said bring your rods your staff and all of you lay them before the, the ark now this is in a desert there's no planting soil there's <laughs> there's nothing they take it in there and lay them before the ark the next day Aaron's rod budded almond branches and produced fruit on the end of the branches in a desert place where nothing like that would grow with no culture at all showing that the power of God produces a beautiful blossom and a beautiful fruit so why would he tell you about the law and the Ten Commandments because he don't want you to die he said this is what's killing you an eye for an eye seed plant and harvest tooth for a tooth seed plant harvest don't do this or this will happen. Don't do this or this will happen. Religion had dulled man's senses down so much they couldn't even, they didn't even know what was killing them. So the whole motive for the law was love. Has the law gone away? No, nay. If the law is gone, then there'll be no babies born tomorrow because the law is seed, plant, harvest. What it is, is it was given to make you free, not to put you in bondage and destroy you. And the moment you start doing this, and you judge someone else by the law, you put yourself in danger of dying by the same law. Hallelujah. Well, that's not popular, Brother Robin. It may not be, but it's true. And it's the kindness of God, the goodness of God that draw men to repentance. The law was meant to make you free. But people became under bondage of it. Because they wanted to sin. Why do we sin, Brother Robin? Because you want to. Oh no. Yes, yes. People say, if you ever hear somebody say, well, do what you want to do. That's what they're going to do anyway. Boy, it's quiet in this room. It's probably quiet across the world right now. People do what they want to anyway. Yes, you do. So what you want to do is make Jesus the Lord of your life. Let the Holy Ghost change your heart so that your want-tos change. Why did you come to Jesus and receive him as Lord? Because you wanted to. He dropped that in your heart and you said, oh, I want him. I want, I want that. You know what people sometimes say when you try to lead them to Jesus? I'm not ready yet. Why? Because I want to do some other thing. I remember somebody asked Brother Hagin one time, said, I don't want to get saved. Told Brother Hagin, said, I don't want to get saved because I can't go to dances no more. She's talking about in these places. I can't go out and do all of that anymore. He said, oh, just don't even think about that. Just come on, get saved. Then you can dance all you want. You can go do all that you want. She said, really? He said, absolutely. She got saved. Then she came back to him later and said, you knew exactly what you were doing, didn't you? She said, because you knew if I got saved, I don't want to do that no more, didn't you? So your want-tos 
wants are your want to's, but he wants you and your want to's. He can change the desire of every heart. All you gotta do is be willing to be willing, and he can be willing to be willing with you. Be willing to be willing. Almost sounds like a name, don't it? What's his name, Be Willing? <laughs> How many of you are glad you came today? Come on, just a little more, and then we're going to change the stop to show you. It wasn't all of that, but that just came out. You know, in my day, back in my day, <laughs> and you know, I'm, I'm probably older than, than a lot of you. Man, I'm way over half a hundred. When when I was, sounds were like this when we were growing up, Robin and I, and I'm older than her. <laughs> but I want you to see if you can hear it. One year, seven months. Yeah, a year and seven months. But, but, but listen, listen to the guitar a minute. You hear it? There's, there's no echoes. Nothing. And it, it used to be like this even before that. Something like that. So it was sounds, that's all we had. There was nothing but an amp and a guitar. And most of the guitar strings were about that tall. And you had to just push to make it play. I mean, this guitar here, oh my goodness. Nobody even conceived a guitar like that when I was a boy. I mean, this is custom built. The, you just touch it. Almost look at it and it'll play. <laughs> oh, you can play it, man. I mean, you can play it. Upside down. It just plays. Then somebody overdriven an amp one day, and it sounded like this. <laughs> And people thought that was the coolest thing in this world. But it had no effects. It was just an overdriven amp. They didn't have pedals. Are you kidding? These pedals? <laughs> we had a fuzz box. Back in the early 70s, I had a fuzz box. It was a triangle pedal that just made a fuzzy sound. You heard a lot of that back then. Oh, you did. Oh, yeah. You, you did. You heard a lot of that fuzzy sound. It went like... It was a fuzzy sound. It was a great sound. You remember? And it was, uh, uh, you know, it was, they wrote about stories. What? Our minds were fuzzy. Yeah, well, 
Our minds did get a little fuzzy in the 70s. It got a little fuzzy, and some of them never came back quite like it was. I mean, really, in my generation, it was, <laughs> wow. Wow. Some of you will remember this. Wow. We could say it backward. Wow. I mean, it was just, you know, I, I shouldn't have told you that. This generation don't even know, need to know that. And, but it was, it was during that day. And sounds were changing. And during about that time, the nation got up on the brink of losing its mind. And the Jesus revolution was born. It was born, it, it happened in late 60s, you know, middle 60s up to the early 70s. And it, it's, it was during the time of Vietnam and all of that, when all of our soldiers were heroes, but somehow or other, the nation called them everything but a hero. It was just crazy. It was upside down. Them fighting for their freedom. <laughs> hey, we don't own our freedom. Well, you should have. You know, so um, ran to other nations. But the sounds changed. They changed. They all changed. And it just kept going and going and going. And then all of a sudden we added a little bit of, of this sound to it. See if you can hear the difference. <laughs> And that's where we were until just a little while ago. Oh, it was. It was. You, you'd play things, man, you know, you, and, and you could beef it up. Just hold your ears if you don't like loud sounds because you could just beef it up, you know. Uh, I better, uh, this is going to kick now. Without a band, it's going to kick. <laughs> And it would just kick. Then lately, I noticed when this generation, the Lord had me change sounds. A lot of it sounds like this now. change to give the next generation a voice and now we're to a place where all of those voices have melted into one voice and I use them all now and I want to be here to see what the next one will sound like I want to, I want to ride it right on over that hill to the next place and see and I know what's coming I have saw it I saw it. I've been to the future, and I saw it. It's the sounds of destiny. That's what's coming. It's the sounds of destiny. It's the sounds that will produce. There's always a sound before an event arrives. Through all those sounds, it came. Through all of those sounds, there was a different move of God happened every single time. I mean, they couldn't get away from it. Even all the way back to Hank Williams singing, I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. It all came back, everything. Until you get up into the 70s when Credence and all that was playing. You could hear some of the songs they were playing. They were searching for an outlet. And people, you know, came on the scene in the Jesus Revolution singing, Why Should the Devil Have All the Good Music? And they started playing and they would sing these broad spectrums of dreams. And now we've climbed on this train with this generation. And 
And I mean to put all the steam I have into it to push them to the top of that hill and get them up over the top of that hill so that this train can carry them by the carloads all over the world, all over the world from China, Japan. It makes a Taiwan. It makes no difference where. Vietnam. And I want to see them out of Mexico. I want to see them from Australia, Russia, Ukraine. I want to see them coming from Israel, from Iran, from all of these places coming to that one name, getting on board of this train, and we chug it up that hill until we up that hill, and it keeps moving. When you get home, do it. If you want to do the Charleston, some of you that old, and when you get home, then you do that. But there is a chord of the future that has been struck into a new generation, and they can hear it reverberate inside them. And the rooftop movement brought it up to the surface, and they produced a brand new sound that last night Zambia, Africa was listening. We had all these nations, Canada, listening. I don't know how many nations were listening. They said, we can hear the sound. We can hear the sound. We can hear the sound. It was a sound. Well, I didn't hear the sound. Well, get your fingers out of your ears, and you might hear something. Because I'll guarantee you, Within that sound somewhere is the sound of the Charleston. In that sound somewhere is the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. And it somewhere is remnants of things that God invented and he carried it to this place. But hear this sound now. That's the chord of the future being strummed. It's the chord of tomorrow. And without them, you have no tomorrow. For I did not ask you to be them. I ask you to help them. For your anointing is your anointing and your call is your call. And that will never change. But it's you that's part of the engine that's helping pull this Jesus train. But we're carrying says the Lord, a radical bunch. The Joshua's and the Caleb's have to carry them there. But we're carrying the radical bunch that will take cities, towns, and states, and nations. And it's your job to carry them there. So get in line to support 
And don't say we never did it this way. But yea, those that came before you said the same of you. We never did it this way. But I do it this way, says the Lord. And I will have my glory fill this earth. Hallelujah. You know, last night there were several times, and I thought I was supposed to say it last night, but the Lord told me to wait. There were several of us heard almost the same thing, but the Lord began to speak to me. What do you say about the generation we'd reached into youth? Uh, he said we touched the future of the future. The future of the future. We went three generations deep. And so, and I want Kayla to get that word up that she had had last night. But I was over there, and the Lord, I, I, my eyes were, were drawn. When Amber came and got on the, the bongos last night, and the Lord began to what started it, it was just a series of different things just started playing out in my mind. And we were talking about a sound, a sound, a sound, hearing a sound. And I, I recalled in 1996 when Robin woke up that morning, or he had been up, he woke us up and said, get up, get ready, we're going to Nashville. And we, it was just Krista, and she was just four, Amber, and, and him and myself, and we got up. We was like, why are we going to Nashville? He said, we're going up there to see Prophet Kim Clement. Then we called him Kim Clement. I, we didn't know that, how to pronounce his name. Everybody else did too. And we was like, okay, because we've been seeing him on, on TBN, but Robin said, we're go, we have to go up there. And so we went up there that night. Some of you heard the story, but you're going to hear it again. Because I want to tell you what an obedience, when the spiritual leader of the family makes a decision and you go and you follow that prophetic leading and we get there. Now, Amber is 15 years old yep. and it's still, anybody ever finds it on She's the one on the front row with the, with the purple pleather jacket on. Vinyl. Vinyl jacket. Vinyl. The only reason Krista's not on there is because she didn't jump high enough. Believe it or not, she was not tall enough to receive the, uh, to get up to see the camera. But it struck a chord in our family. And... Amber began to weep when we were leaving Nashville. We got on the other side of Nashville almost to Franklin. And she's crying. And she said, I, want, I don't want to leave. She's 15. I don't want to leave. And so he was going to be there the next night. And we had a decision to make. Now hear that. We had a decision. Do we keep on going back to Alabama? Yeah. Or do we listen to a cry of a 15-year-old saying, I want to go back. I want to go back. We had no clothes to change into. That's a big deal with me. Hygiene is really important to me. I think everybody needs a good bath. <laughs> I used to tell, when things used to get heated in the house, I'd just tell everybody, calm down, go get a bath. <laughs> I said, I'm a mom. I'm starting, what are we going to do? We ain't got any, we don't have an extra set of clothes. We, I mean, we, we can't sleep in these and wear them the next day. What, we, we, we will smell. What are we going to do? You see, my natural mind is just swirling. So, but we did have to sleep in those clothes that night. And we got up and went to the mall the next day. I don't know how we had the money. Well, I could tell you, but we're just going to... 
I have a Sears and Roebuck card. That's in the, you don't have to say no more. <laughs> <laughs> so we go over to, I, I'm, I'm wondering about the, the hotel we stayed in. Yeah, I don't know that either. I know, and I don't even want to. Red Roof Inn, maybe? I don't know. That's what it was. It's pretty, that was pretty, you know, affordable back then. And so we go over to, uh, to the mall, Rivergate. Rivergate Mall, and we went over there, and we're going to get us some clothes, you know, but, of course, coffee first. <laughs> and the cry of a 15-year-old brought us straight to the prophet sure did. at a coffee shop. And Matt and Lori Crouch was in there. Kim and Jane and their prophet Kim and, and Jane and their I remember baby buggies. Yeah, I don't know what, who was in it. And uh, I had told Donna, she said, I don't think I was there then. But I looked and I didn't want to. I mean, you're talking about, I'm, I'm thinking, I don't even want these people to see me. We, uh, you know, I mean, we've slept in these clothes. All because a 15-year-old started that pull. And I just went up to the, the guy at the counter and I said, I, I said, I want to pay for all their coffee. I was led to pay for their coffee. And I was just going to slip out the side. And they said, who? They said, thank you, thank you. What's your name? And, and uh, it was Matt or Lori, they said, what's your name? What's your name? And I said, my name's Robin. And, uh, and you know, I'm just trying to get out because I don't even, I wasn't even wanting to have conversation. And about that time, when I walked out, the prophet come out of that coffee shop and he was walking with a purpose and a fire in his eyes until I was just like, he said, why did you do that? I said, because I couldn't build the prophet a room, but I could buy his coffee. I have th thanked the Lord for that response yeah. for years and years and years. Because that was the quickest I've ever thought on my feet, I think. He said, what would you have me to do for you. for you? I said, pray for direction for my family. And he prayed. And that night, and Miss Betty, I just found out you was there that night. I mean, they told me you were there in the choir. In, in the choir. And that when, when they told me that, I said, I remember her sitting up yeah. there in that choir. We were on the front row. Now, all of this happened because a cry of a 15-year-old and a sound that reverberated in her and the willingness of parents to say, we will do what it takes. I hadn't saw her that free in a service. And the Lord brought us to the front row that night. Yeah. We didn't ask to be on the front row. We didn't seek to be on the front row. But somebody was watching that saw a, a person rush in and take our stuff and put it behind in another seat after we had placed our, our things in a seat and we were going to go just tour the grounds. And Lori Crouch saw that woman do that sure did. and come out and said, Robin... She said, are, these are, is these seats okay for y'all on the front row? And she said, are those seats okay that you have? Yeah. Or do you, and we said, uh, and, and anyway, she, said, she brought us to the front. Yeah, no, your seats are up yeah, here. Yeah, your seats are up here. So we were at the front seat <laughs> to see such a monumental service That's the truth. that absolutely took place. 
And Miss Betty, you're a witness to it. The night he broke that glass on that stage. And, you know, that disappeared from the Internet. It disappeared. People took it off. But we were there to see the prophet take the glass, turn it over of judgment, and break it on the stage. And it was such a monumental. People were on their faces. Jane Crouch fell out in the glass, glass. right in the middle of the glass. She didn't get cut. You remember that? But it was because... A 15-year-old heard a sound and, and just said, please. Now, she didn't have the authority in our family. We could have said, you know, we got to get back, honey. We got to get back. It, it's, you know, we, we, we don't, we, this is too much. But I was reading, and I kept hearing about the, um, about when, the uh, prophet Elisha told, uh, was it Joash, to strike the ground? No, uh, it was, king, uh, um, told the king, I, I've got it in my, if you'll get my Bible, right, please, and bring it to me. I've got it marked in there. He said, strike the ground. And he, he first took the arrow and he, he opened the window and he, he shot the arrow out. Right. And it was for Israel. But then he said to take it and strike the ground. Yeah. And he did it three times. And he said, why didn't you do it five or six? Because it would have never, captivity wouldn't have come had you done it. And the Lord told me this morning, he said, you're striking the ground for the generations to come. Get yourselves off your minds, adults, and start striking the ground. It's not like when when the word of the Lord came to the king and he said, "Oh, this is a good word." He said, "This is a good word that we will, that it won't happen in our time." He didn't care if it happened in the He didn't children. care if it happened in his children's time or his grandchildren's time. It's not his. But I looked on stage last night. And because of the cry of a 15-year-old, she cried out into the future of her children. Of her children. And they were on stage. They were worshiping with her. Her cry went all the way into the future of her children. And because we said, because we didn't have, uh, like the minister said, we didn't have any better sense to do but what God told us to do. Because we came into this with nothing. When I say nothing, I mean nothing. Yeah, with a big N. <laughs> with a big knot. To the O, to the H, to the... <laughs> yeah, it was a big knot. Nothing. Nothing. But a willing heart to do what God said do. And that sound, yeah. there was a sound made in Nashville it that was. night. Or it really wasn't Nashville, it was, it was Goodlettsville, Hendersonville. Hendersonville. And there was a sound went forth that night yeah. that it went through my family. And now it went through my grandchildren. Yeah. And now it's going through your children and your grandchildren. And that sound last night, it, it reverberated out of here until it went into other nations, other, other countries, other states, people's lives. It was a sound that was yeah. made. And I'm going to tell you something. I will guard that. I have had people say, that's not my bag. I'm out of here. I I will take this. It is not for one. Listen, it, there's people here from 8 to 80 years old that is, that is a part of this. What, what, what would make 80 years old come and, and do this? If I was 80, I would be here. The other night, one of the youth, I think it was AJ, that does all the flips. I just stood over there and thought, 
you go, guy. And he came over there and did like this to me. And I thought, okay. Do you, un do you know what happened that when he did that? You gave a prophetic word. I don't know how many years ago. You said, the young and the old will dance together. And the young will leave. And, and the, the old, old will be glad. Yes, be glad. And without knowing it, that's what happened. You walked into a rendezvous of a prophetic moment. That's what happened. Kayla, come up here with that word right quick. And we, we saw, we, we saw that prophecy oh, yeah. be fulfilled. And, and I, I'm not. That's the exact prophecy. That happened just like You're that. watching. You're watching prophecy unfold. You're watching a generation, a cry. Some is 15. So that's how old Peyton is. Yeah. That's how old your mother was. Yeah. When she heard that sound that night that yeah. reached into and brought. And I looked down and our youngest, she's dancing. Go ahead and read that thing. As I was watching last night, I just heard the Lord say, we are hearing the sound of the older generation and the younger generation together. We had Sherry stretching herself over Maddie. And uh, it said, we need the sound of the older and the younger generation to come together for the sound of the future generation. That's what I was talking about. Yes, it says, and Joash... The king of Israel came down. It was the came down and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the, uh, uh, the chariot and the horsemen thereof. I'm in the wrong. Yeah, uh, the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take, no, I'm in the right one. Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon thy bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hand upon the king's hand. Yeah. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The era of the Lord's deliverance and the era of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till this uh, till thou have consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. See, see, here is something very crucial about this prophetic moment. Children are like the arrows in a quiver. And when he told him to shoot out that window, he said, the era of the Lord's deliverance. So it was to be delivered unto another generations and generations to come. But then a choice had to be made. And notice Elisha or Elisha did not influence the choice. He just said, smite the ground. Take the arrows and smite the ground. And the king smote it three times. That was his choice. Though a prophetic event takes place and a prophetic moment in time happens, it's your choice to what you're going to do with that time. The Bible said that the sons of Issachar were men of understanding. That's where the prophets actually kind of came from was Issachar. It said they were seers. They, had, they understood the signs of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Not what they would do, not what they would choose to do, but what they ought to do. Something about that, when he said smite the ground, he smote it three times. Why would the prophet be angry? If the king had have acted with a better choice, you wouldn't be facing a lot of the things you see in the Mideast today. He said, why didn't you smite it five or six times? It was his last act 
that he could do. You want to know what, what Elisha died of? The Bible said it was his sickness. Didn't say he got sick and died. Said it was his sickness. He would spend the time praying 24 hours a day almost. To hear where the enemies of Israel, to hear where Syria would be placing their army for an ambushment against Israel. That was the most deadly foe of Israel's day during his time as prophet. And he prayed, and he, now remember, he's not born again. Nobody was born again until Jesus died and rose from the dead. He's operating under the Abrahamic covenant. So what he has to do takes two, three, four times more than what you do to hear God. And he would spend his nights and probably not eating, not sleeping, nothing. It would, it would stay on his mind until he would actually hear the conversations in the king of Syria's bedchamber. And then he would go to the king of Israel and say, move your army because this is where they're coming to. And it, it pulled him down so much that it killed him. Wow. He died of his sickness. He just wore himself out over Israel. He loved it, loved Israel so. He said, they're not going down on my watch. But when it came to the king, kings make their own choices. And it had to be something in the king's heart to choose. And the king shot the arrow. He did everything. And it's obvious the king was operating on Elisha's revelation. Because he said, my father, my father. The horsemen of Israel and the chariots there of the, or the, uh, and the chariots there. That's what Elisha saw when Elijah was called away. He said, now smite the ground. Can you see the old prophet maybe on his bed dying? He said, smite the ground. I've got to see this done before I leave. Smite the ground. He hit it three times. He said, why didn't you hit it five or six? You would have totally defeated them. And they were cruel. I mean cruel. He said, now you'll only beat them back three times. So the choice comes to you. We have shot the arrow. And in the day Robin was talking about, the arrow landed here. The pull that took us up there is now the pull that's drawing you here. Some of you right now watching have thought about, people ask on the chat last night, where is this happening? Why would you ask? Because you're being pulled here. And you're being pulled to save a generation yet to come. I mean, look where people are from that are here. You know, some of you might have came from Gardendale. They came from Taiwan. There is a difference. It's a lot further east than Springville. But I'm going to tell you something. Now the air is here. And the Lord's saying, open the window and shoot. Let your children go forth ahead of you from this place. Pull it back and shoot. And, but he didn't say, that ain't enough. Now take the arrows and smite the ground with it. Make the sound rumble the earth. Smite it. But don't smite it three times. Hit it five or six times so that their generation will walk in total victory and not just be beaten three times. Or not win three times, but win forever. So we're for this is the Joshua 
and Caleb generation that are, are helping these across. You say, what can I do? I'm 80. So was he. What can I do? I'm 80. Caleb said at 80, give me the mountain with the giants on it. I'm going to take down the giants so that my posterity can live. This is the time when we come together. They led 20-year-olds across the Jordan. And they made history from that crossing. But I can't tell you how many times to hit the ground. I can only tell you, open the window and let's shoot. And you've done it. Now what? Well, I, it's just not my thing. What is your thing? What is it then? If these are not your thing, you need to go back across the Jordan. That's where they said, I'll go back and have my, I want my inheritance on the other side. Joshua said, fine. But you're going to cross and help get them over first and get them settled. Now that's the Lord's answer to you. That's the Lord's answer. You know that prophetic move was so strong in Kim Clement's meeting. Oh, it woke up not only in Amber, it woke it up in me. And all of a sudden, everything in my life made sense. And, and Amber knew it. Let's don't go back. Let's don't go back. God, we should have just moved there then. Just moved there. And then I look. There's Miss Betty was on the stage. And we're together. Who would have guessed? Who would have guessed? I mean, we wouldn't have, nobody would have guessed. <clears throat> but the arrow was shot from that stage that night. It landed here. And now we've shot it from here. Where will it land next? <laughs> well, you know, I'm not going to turn this generation loose. You know, I walk in the, a mantle like Elisha. People say, oh, you're like John the Baptist. You're like John the Baptist. <clears throat> That's only because Elisha had traits like Elijah. But in that mantle, it is to see the generation ahead make it. And I learn lessons. I learn from Elisha. Don't destroy yourself. And I try. But last night I'm up most of the night. But I'm listening to my family. And the other night when that sound came off this stage, that first night when Krista was of the, that first night it hit. Not, it was after the conference. Few, then it hit. But when it hit, this is my thought as I went home. I said, the future is in good hands. I did. That's what I said. I said, the future is in good hands. And I remembered that old movie. That's something, isn't it? You know, you just, I remembered that old, that old movie where Clint Eastwood played. He was a, won the Congressional Medal of Honor, and he was, I forget what it was called now. And he was, they called him Gunny. He was a gunnery sergeant. They called him Gunny. And he was absolutely rough as sandpaper. And you could watch it, but the language is horrible. But he's going through there, and he gets right down to the end, and he comes back from Grenada. And he was his last war. He came back and he got off the plane and he was, he's got all these aches and pains and he's walking with his M16 and he's coming out of there and he talks like this. <laughs> and he said, a young guy about 23 looked at him and said, <clears throat> you thought he was going to desert or run or never enlist again, the young one. The young one said, 
I re-upped. He said, <laughs> he said, I re-upped. He caught it. He caught the vision of another generation. He said, what about you, Gunny? He said, oh, no, I've had it. I've had it. He went through, like, Korea, Vietnam, all this stuff. He said, besides, they have you now. He saw the future was secure. And one day, when I'm so old, you look around and go, God, you're old. <laughs> you know? <laughs> one day when that happens, I know I can look and say, how oh, they have you now. They have you now. Now make no mistake, I'm going to be old when that day comes. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help pull that train to the top of that hill. And I've already saw what I'd be doing in the future. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So how many times will you smite the ground? And I'm talking to people, parents, how many times will you hit the ground? Or are you just going to wallow in your own selfishness? You don't have any me time anymore. You have they time now. That's what you better catch hold of. Unless you're just willing to give it all away. Well, I ain't. I ain't. Listen, I'm 63 years old standing up here jumping up and down with the youth last night, telling them, jump, 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 jump. I mean, just jumping. Well, I will be in August. That's pretty close. People say, you don't, you know, you don't look over, over 58. <laughs> yeah. Robin would say, yeah. He said, you just look like you're pushing 58. Yeah, he's pushed it all the way to 63. <laughs> so today is a deciding day. Yeah. That era in Nashville landed right here. Yeah. Krista Jordan, it landed here. And the little one that couldn't even jump up high enough to be seen on camera is up on the stage with the rooftop movement. She taught us to live on the wild side. 